Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to tell you that just setting this up has been terrifying. <laughs> I'm very, very terrified right now, but I will do my best. So as you see, I want to sell my tech savvy persona. I have two computers here, you see. <laughs> I'll do my best thing. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I want to take you today uh, through a very scary, horrendous, and terrifying history of Spanish literature. So, thank you all for being here today, and thank you everyone who made this possible. For today's date, I wanted to take you on a tour of the creepiest motives in Spanish literature. And what better way to do that than, than by exploring antiquity, the golden age, and romanticism. I promise it will be a descent to hell. <laughs> but first, coming attractions. I know, I know Seneca the Younger doesn't qualify as Spanish, but he was born in the Roman province of Hispania in the city that now we know as Cordoba, a place that we are bound to explore this coming May term. And his birth uh, here is not worthy, yet it is primarily his profound impact on Western literary history that earns him mention in this discourse. Seneca is chiefly remembered as a pivotal figure within the philosophical enclave of Stoicism. A philosophical school that we won't delve into, but extremely popular nowadays if you want to read more about it. The early Roman Empire's literature often harbored a morbid fascination with death and carnage, with Seneca exemplifying this penchant. In, contra in contrast uh, to Greek tragedies with typically veiled acts of violence behind the curtains, um, the tragedy spent by Seneca boldly brought the gruesome spectacles center stage. Um, wait, because I don't know how to use this computer. Okay, crave examples. In Troades, Troades, a messenger explains to Andromaca the death of her son. The bones were scattered and crushed by the accident. The marks of the body and the mouth and those noble marks of the father show the lowest weight given to the earth. The air was loosened by the impact of the cilions. The head was severed with the brain completely, yeah, Sorry. <laughs> Squeezed. The body lay deformed. He later adds, a crowd of leaders and plebeians flocked from all sides. In Oedipus, a messenger tells the ice moment, and thus saying savagely, and as if they wanted to get out of their orbits, furious, bold, ferocious, as only madmen are, 
He groans and rage. He buried his hands in his eyes. He avidly searches for their sockets. And at the time, same time, tears out the two gloves of their eyes, completely uprooting them. His fingers dig, dig into the open cavity and sinking into the bottom, he lacerates the depth of the already empty orbit with his nails. He cuts the fibers that still hang from his badly plucked eyes. Horrible streams of blood bathe his fa face and his mutilated head. A stream of blood gushes from his torn veins. So what is the origin of this dark theme? First, as mentioned, Seneca was a Stoic, and Stoicism focuses uh, on dealing with suffering. Additionally, he lived in very turbulent times, serving as Nero's tutor. When Nero suspected Seneca of being part of a plot to kill him, he forced Seneca into commit suicide. Following tradition, Seneca ended his life by cutting several veins to bleed to death. Here you can see a romantic period rendition, period rendition by Manuel Dominguez Sánchez and displayed at the Museo del Prado in Madrid, which, by the way, we will also visit on May term. <laughs> Seneca's stylish choices were in line with the realism and starkness characteristics of Roman literature of his time. Yet, Interestingly, Seneca's influence made its way to Spain via Italy, a region experiencing its renaissance, a revival hearkening back to the glorious Roman era. The centuries before the Renaissance, the territory now known as Spain was deeply engrossed in internal wars as well as fighting the Muslim rule, a struggle that significantly anchored its identity in Catholicism. Catholicism, with its core principle of divine providence, the belief that God will provide, stands at odds with the tragic narrative. This ideology makes it hard to reconcile with the green conclusions typical of tragedies. Due to these factors, along with the emergence of a unique theatrical style, as articulated by Lope de Vega in his pioneering manifesto, New Art of Making Comedies in Our Time, a distinctive Spanish style blossomed. This style favored a tapestry of genres within a single play, weaving together elements of emotion, tension, humor, suspense, elevated dialogues, and folk culture. Although not completely abs absent from Spanish stages, the rigid framework for tragedy was deemed too constricting, both stylistically and philosophically, for the Spanish palette. It is within this innovative theatrical landscape that we move into our next intriguing chapter. The Ghostly. Spanish literature has mainly contributed three literary myths to the world. La Celestina, the matchmaker, published in 1499, and work that marks a complete break from the medieval mindset. El Quijote, published in 1605, the first part, the second part in 1615, a novel that presents a hero who is well known and needs no further introduction. And Don Juan, character that makes his initial appearance in the play El Burlador de Sevilla, or The Trickster of Seville, likely premiered in 1616. Though traditionally attributed to Tirso de Molina, modern computational sty stylometry opposes Tirso's authorship of the play. You might also think of Carmen, but unlike the previous examples, Carmen, the central figure of the novel by Prosper Marimé, is a French creation not Spanish. Published in 1845, it served as the inspiration for the acclaimed opera by Bisset, Carmen. Carmen represents the pinnacle of the lingering romantic perception of Spain, underdeveloped, irrational, 
and primitive, often populated by hypersexualized women. Additionally, these letter works are set in Andalusia, in the southern part of Spain, and we will have the opportunity to visit the locations described in them during our May term. <laughs> Returning to our trickster, within the medieval Spanish oral tradition, uh, there is a pervasive legend commonly known through the ballad El Galán y la Calavera. In this tale, a carefree and lively young man comes across a skull, which he invites to a meal to mock it. The twist unfolds when the deceased accepts the invitation and, in return, invites the young man to dine at his own grave. Some scholars trace the origin of this legend to the local location marked by an arrow. I should mention that I come from that area of Spain, a region rich with tales of the dead roaming the woods. One such tale is that of the Holy Company, a Santa Compaña. The Holy Company is described as a procession of tormented phantom souls wandering the countryside at night, led by a living individual under a spell. Unaware of their role, this person feels exhausted during the day due to their nightly excursions. This is a photo of the Santa Compaña that I personally captured in Galicia last Christmas. Uh, my cell phone lens was sent exactly clean and I apologize for that. But let's return to the roots of the trickster of Seville. Another inspiration uh, for, uh, for the archetype of the trickster, a figure prevalent, prevalent across the continent. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. Another inspiration is the archetype of the trickster, a figure prevalent across the continent, embodying a brazen young man. In some countries, he's a thief. In others, he's a common. But in Spain, he's a flirtatious man who attends mass to seduce women. <laughs> While there are numerous theories suggesting real individuals who might have inspired the character of Don Juan, we'll focus on these two ideas. The plot of the trickster of Seville unfolds as follows. Act 1. In 16th century Naples, Don Juan disguises himself to pursue the Duchess, but he is exposed. His uncle, Don Pedro, helps him escape, falsely accusing Octavio of the crime. It is revealed that Don Juan is promised to Doña Ana, but continues his deceit, tricking a fisherwoman into a fake vow, leaving her dishonored, and she tries to kill herself. Act 2. Informed of the incident, King Don Alf Alfonso cancels Don Juan's engagement to Doña Ana. And the third, Don Juan deceives Doña Ana, who loves, uh, and, uh, deceives Doña Ana and kills her father, Don Gonzalo, when confronted. The king seeks harsher punishment, but Don Juan escapes, targeting now a bride to be at another engagement party. Uh, I have here a virus threat, very terrifying. So, act three, Don Juan seduces Aminta, about to marry Batracio, Patricio, with false promises. The rounded women, including the fishermen from act one, rally for justice. And now, I'm going to stop here because I think that you will agree with me that this guy is terrifying. Don Juan is a very well-recognized European myth. Not many characters in Europe's history have inspired so many readings, readings interpretations, and versions. The character from the trickster of Seville has been depicted in various ways. I've only mentioned a few here. His story has been retold in many plays, operas, poems, novels, and films. Both poets and philosophers have shown interest in Don Juan. Why? 
His psychology ranges from displaying hypertrophied masculinity to having difficulty breaking away from his mother, leading to a continuous search for her replacement, to being completely puzzled. Why does Juan have this unending desire to be with every woman he meets? Why does he use such objectionable mythos to, methods to reach his goals? In his aesthetics, Hegel sees Don Juan representing unrelenting desire, a restless spirit driven by self-consuming wants. Kierkegaard views Don Juan as exemplifying an aesthetic life, marked by the pursuit of sensory pleasure and immediacy, contrasting it with an ethical life of commitment. Unamuno perceives Don Juan's quest for women as a deeper existential journey towards the absolute and infinite. In the myth of Sisyphus, Camille depicts Don Juan as an absurd hero, embracing life's meaningless through passion and sensual pursuit, despite ensuing suffering. Otto Fenichel associates Don Juanism with a narcissistic quest for validation and achievement, describing a cycle for an ending conquest driven by an unconscious guilt. If this hasn't sent shivers down your spine yet, allow me to unveil the play Climax. In a churchyard of Seville, marking the apex of his depravity, Don Juan recklessly invites the statue of the late Don Gonzalo for a dinner rendezvous. This eerie banquet, laden with ominous forebodings, heralds Don Juan's inevitable downfall as he brazenly confronts his destiny and his hold to the abyss. <laughs> now, I encourage you to delve deeper into the mindset of the Spanish Golden Age. I'm referring to more than just the remarkable outcomes from the collaboration of Italian set designers, the expertise of the Commedia Nueva structure, the innovative dramaturgy style, and the boundless creativity of Spanish playwrights. I invite you to venture further and ponder the societal impact in a culture that believes in the possibility of hell and is deeply committed to the idea of free will, recalling the staunch Catholic defense of human free will against the deterministic Protestant view. Here we are, observing a steadfast character who had ample opportunities for redemption, yet consciously and willingly chooses to accept a fate of eternal damnation. It is a tough pill to swallow. Isn't it too ghostly? Are you ready for the gory? Please say hello to Doña Maria de Zayas y Sotomayor. You might assume that a female writer was an exception during the Spanish early modern period. However, that's far from the truth. Among numerous religious women writers discussing a variety of topics and several secular female writers, we can mention, for instance, Doña Mariana de Carvajal and Saavedra, whose work gives us insight into the social gatherings, courtesy norms, entertainments, and romantic, friendly, and neighborly relationships of her time. Or we could discuss Doña Ana Caro de Mayen, who centered her works around adventures and the turning women. And of course, how to overlook Santa Teresa de Jesus, who was all about CEO strategies and also ecstasy. <coughs> well, that was really scary. <laughs> Female writers. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to Maria de Zayas y Sotomayor. Doña Maria de Zayas y Sotomayor, recognized by several modern critics as one of the early proponents of literary feminism, authored two collections of short stories, among other works, 
both structured in a Decameronian frame, where individuals gather and share stories to pass the time. These collections enjoy substantial public and critical acclaim, with 10 editions published solely in the 17th century. In the first collection, amorous and exemplary novels, as you can say, there is a uh, reference here to Cervantes' exemplary novels. Over the span of five nights, five women and five men narrate stories, all featuring female protagonists. The recurring theme is honor, particularly exploring women's vulnerability and men's dominance over them. Thayas scrutinizes both literally and societal codes of honor, employing them as a medium to investigate gender dynamics and women's subordinated status. It's not worthy that the 17th century saw shifts in gender theories regarding women's nature. Instead of typecasting, typecasting women as maternal figures, they were not perceived as disorderly and unruly. It was believed that female physiology, characterized by its cold and moist humors, rendered women capricious, deceitful, and troublesome. Any deviation in a woman's behavior was deemed significant as the state analogized the husband-wife relationship to the broader dynamic of subordinates in relation to their superiors within the growing state itself. In the second part, Doña Maria de Zayas raises the bet. While it's precarious to label her work as feminist given the era, it's hard to overlook the assertive ideas found throughout her writings. This collection, often this second collection, often referred to as disappointments, takes on a darker, more pessimistic tone, aiming to unveil the harsh realities masked by societal pretenses. This narrative aligns well with the broader theme of the Spanish golden era that you're going to see in many, many works of this period, starting by El Quixote, which revolves around discerning the often disappointing truths hidden behind appearances. These disappointments unfold during the symbolic setting of carnival, carnival festivities, a time traditionally associated with masks or foul, false facades. Though the narrative framework retains a mixed audience, only women take on the role of narrators this time, making them the total protagonist. Unlike the first part, where women reclaim or defend their honor and autonomy, in this part, women are portrayed as victims of a harsh and just society that turns a deaf ear to their needs. Thaya's narrative is filled with conflict, deceit, and violence, painting them as inevitable facets of matrimony. Here, her storytelling pivots around the theme of torture. While classic gore and contemporary gore narratives might serve to evoke strong emotions, aiding catharsis, Thayas employs torture over the feminine body as the proxy of societal norms, particularly regarding women's treatment. Her, her stories, far from offering catharsis, leave readers with a sense of emotional devastation. The book delves into various forms of torture, physical, emotional, psychological, magical, supernatural, and social. Socially, women face defamation, exclusion, or coerced marriages owing to societal norms and expectations. Feminine isolation is also explored with characters being imprisoned or secluded, plunging them into profound loneliness and despair. Notably, many male characters in this book are named, can you guess how? Don who? No, but you were close. Don Juan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Establishing a dialogue 
with the infamous trickster. So do you want me to go into more detail? Yeah? Are you sure? Will you endure it? Yeah? OK. You asked for it. <laughs> So, in love for the sake of conquest, Esteban repeatedly disguises himself as a woman to seduce Laurela. In this tale, Tallas explores themes of transvestism and homosexuality. When the scam is unveiled, Laurela feels betrayed, but eventually succumbs to Esteban's advances, this time as a man, only to be abandoned by him shortly after. As a punishment, her father and uncle caused a wall to collapse onto her. Laurela was found dead as the wall had struck her head, leading her to suffocate beneath the rubble. More? OK. In most infamous revenge, Octavia is seduced by Carlos through false promises of marriage. When her brother Juan discovers this, he pressures her to enter a convent to restore her honor. Later, Carlos marries Camila, but soon grows tired of her, prompting Juan to plot his revenge. He attempts to seduce Camila to dishonor her, but faced with her rejections, he devises a plan. One day, disguised as a woman, he manages to lure Camila to her own bedroom. Once inside, he locks the room, threatens her with a dagger, causing her to bleed, and rapes her, telling her she will pay for her husband's dishonoring of Octavia. Upon learning about Camila's rape, Carlos poisons her, leading to her slow and agonizing death. And it was the case that the poison did not take her life, but she swelled so monstrously that her arms and legs looked like very fat columns, and her belly extended a large rod away from her waist. Only the face was not swollen. She never got out of bed, and in this way she lived for six months. Okay. <laughs> In Marriage Abroad, Portent of Doom, Rodney, I love you, whoever you are, <laughs> Thayas introduces four Spanish sisters, three of whom marry foreigners. One sister is killed by her husband, who wishes to be rid of her. The youngest sister, living with them, fears for her life and leaps out of the window, breaking her legs. She remains bedridden for the few remaining years of her life. Another sister is hanged by her husband, who uses her own beautiful hair to fashion a noose around her throat, choking her to death, and then poisons their child. The narrative concentrates then on the last sister, Doña Blanca, who after a lot of uh, unjust accusations, mm, is bled to death by her father-in-law and husband. And I think that now that we have come this far, we should keep going. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Innocence Punished, in which Don Diego seeks the help of a Moorish necromancer to cast a spell on Doña Inés, enable him to rape her every night. The necromancer provides him with a wax figurine representing her. And when it is lit, Doña Inés, in a trance, goes to Don Diego's bedroom when she's raped over the course of many nights. Once the story comes to light, Doña Inés' husband walls her up for six years. Upon her eventual release, thanks to a female neighbor showcasing Thaya's emphasis on sorority, they witnessed the following. When she was locked away, she was no more than 24 years old. And now, after six years, she was 30, which was the prime of her age. Initially, although she had clear eyes, she was blind, either from the darkness or from cry crying she had lost her sight. 
her beautiful hair, which was like a strands of gold when she entered, now white as snow was tangled and infested with little creatures that, bred, that breathed if not calmed, in such a quantity that they seemed to boil over. The color of her skin was the color of death. She was so thin and wasted that her bones showed as if the skin covering them were a thin cloth. Her clothes had turned to ashes, revealing most parts of her body. She was barefoot and her legs covered in the excrement of her body, since she had nowhere to dispose of it, had not only decomposed, but her flesh itself had been eaten away up to the thighs by sores and worms, filling the foul place with an unbearable stench. So you can imagine why people like me uh, stay in these other periods of history when they talk uh, to us about so or things like that, we're like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Inquisition. Oh my God, do you know this? Nobody expects in Spanish Inquisition. Oh my God, what a scare. I cannot think of anything worse in the whole history of mankind. Also, attend my classes, exactly Spanish 230, if you're interested in learning how this myth was created. And this is the end, my friends. I don't want to end this lecture in such a trickling tone, but rather I want to end it with love and hope. Do you remember that I told you that there are endless versions of the history of Don Juan, the trickster of Seville? Well, I think that without a doubt, the most beloved one by Spaniards is Don Juan Tenorio, religious and fantastic drama in two parts, as it is titled, a play craft by the Spanish poet and playwright José Zorrilla in 1844. This work offers a romantic reinterpretation of the enduring myth, taking many elements from the original, yet reducing the narrative to a primary storyline. Don Juan emerges as a bold, captivating, captivating man from Seville, indulging in his sexual adventures liberally. As the tale progresses, it's unveiled that he and his companion, Don Luis, are entangled in a competitive wager over who can seduce a greater number of women. In a climatic revelation, Don Juan mentions that a novice nun is the only conquest missing from his list. This claim unnerves Don Luis, especially since his fiance is yet to leave the combat, drawing Don Juan's attention towards her. The rivalry intensifies as Don Luis attempts to thwart Don Juan's schemes unsuccessfully, as Don Juan will seduce Doña Ana, Don Luis's fiancé. But who is exactly this Don Juan? Huh? Unlike the utterly despicable Don Juan of the original narrative of the trickster of Seville, Zorrilla's Don Juan Tenorio embodies the utmost badass. His ability to seduce goes beyond his handsome appearance. It's his command over language that leaves women spellbound. When Don Juan speaks, women can't help but be captivated. He embodies the ultimate feminine fantasy of taming the wild. He's a tempest that only one woman on earth can soothe into a gentle breeze. So we found our protagonist now, after seducing Doña Ana, on his way to the convent with his eyes set in, on Doña Inés, his fiancé, our, our female lead. He has been courting her through letters delivered discreetly by Brigida, the matchmaker who appears here again. 
Upon sneaking into her bedroom at the convent, Doña Inés faints, and Don Juan takes her to his residence, nestled by the beautiful banks of the Guadalquivir River. Upon regaining consciousness, one of the quintessential scenes in the annals of the Spanish theater unfolds. Doña Inés is sitting on a chest long, el divan, in rapture, in love, while Don Juan, kneeling before her, woos her with his enthralling words. Unwittingly, he too falls for her charm and now finds himself ensnared in the very trap he laid. Yet, misfortune strikes as Don Gonzalo, Doña Inés' father, enters the scene. Don Juan pleads for his blessing to marry Doña Inés, but Don Gonzalo, in a fit of rage, vehemently denies. A confrontation follows, leading to Don Juan fatally striking Don Gonzalo. Faced with no other choice, Don Juan flees Seville. Thus concludes the first part. In the second part, each part has three acts. In the second part, Don Juan returns to Seville after five years in exile. He discovers that his father has passed away, as has Doña Inés' father, which we already know, we already knew, because he killed him. <laughs> and sadly, Doña Inés too has succumbed to a broken heart. Don Juan ventures to his father's house, which has now become a cemetery where all his victims lay. And in a moment of somber reflection mixed with mockery, he laments over the people whose lives he shattered, especially the tragic fate of Doña Inés. Yet, in a whimsical act, he extends an invitation to Don Gonzalo's statue for dinner. The tale unfolds into an eerie evening where Don Juan dines. And the ghost of Don Gonzalo, having accepted the invitation, materializes to drag Don Juan to hell. But wait, this narrative is born in the romantic period where love conquers all. Though I may recount this with a touch of humor, it's crucial to note that a significant shift in the European philosophical sphere was necessary to arrive at this perspective. Many, many shifts, but being one of them, the idea, the identification of women as the angel of the house. They are not these unruly beings anymore now. They are the angel of the house, okay? They can save, okay? Now the twist you didn't see coming the ghost of Doña Inés. Yes, my friends, Doña Inés also shows up to dinner. Now the stage is filled with spectral apparitions. An extremely spectacular moral confrontation between the father and the daughter takes place. Don Gonzalo tries to drag Don Juan to the inferno, while Doña Inés begs him to repent. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Don Juan repents, and he, along with Doña Inés, ascend to heaven amidst angelical chanting in grand apotheosis. Zorrillas Don Juan Tenorio premiered in March 1844, achieving unparalleled success. So much that by 1922, Spaniards were already producing a film based on it. The play even sparked a new tradition in Spain. On October 31st, today, the eve of All Saints' Day in Catholic countries, Spaniards would flock to the theater for many years to witness this play. Audiences knew the verses by heart, and there were rankings for the best portrayals of Don Juan and Doña Inés. On this night, what could be better than enjoying the greatest love story of all times, a love beyond death, filled with ghostly appearances? Some Spaniards, including myself, when I had the chance, continue to attend this performance. However, Halloween 
is overshadowing this local tradition. Particularly amid the dramatic, uh, dramatic cultural shift, both vertically and horizontally. My parents' generation cherished this play, eagerly anticipating the theater outing every October 31st. Nowadays, it's challenging to find many individuals under 40 years old in Spain with a decent knowledge of the play, especially as the current community undergoes fragmentation due to a variety of factors that I won't delve into here. But believe me when I say that I think it was a beautiful tradition. And um, by the way, I thought you might enjoy seeing me portraying Doña Inés in Don Juan Tenorio. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I look forward to possibly seeing you again in an exact year when another member of our faculty will deliver another terrifying or terrific <laughs> lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.